And now we're going to look at one of the manuscripts that I think is one of the most remarkable manuscripts in the history of art, uh, as well as in the Carolingian period. These are the Ebo Gospels. Uh, they are uh, characteristic of the Rem school, and we'll hear more about that. They are created in the early 9th century, probably during the rule of Louis the Pious. We call this the Ebo Gospels because there is a colophon, an inscription, that says that Abbot Peter of the monastery at Hovers gave the manuscript to Ebo, the Archbishop of Rams. And we know that Ebo was the Archbishop of Rams from 816 to 835. And then I think I mentioned that there were some problems uh, with the two abbots being uh, appointed. Uh, he came back for a few years when Lothar became the um, emperor. Um, Ebo is quite an interesting person in, in several respects and very involved with politics. He actually was the son of a serf, but he rose first to be the librarian at Aachen, at the palace of Charlemagne, and uh, he was appointed uh, Archbishop of Rams by Louis the Pious, Charlemagne's son, and the next emperor. At first he was loyal to Louis, but then when Louis's sons uh, rebelled against their father and started to want to take over the kingdom before they inherited it, Ebo switched sides, and he uh, was on the sides of the sons when it looked like Louis was going to lose. Well, Louis won, <laughs> and so Arch the archbishop was deposed. Uh, and then Louis died, and Lothar, be his uh, oldest son, became the emperor for just a brief period of time. Uh, he reappointed Ebo, but when he died, uh, the youngest son of Louis the Pious was Charles the Bald by another mother. And he was the one who had always remained loyal to his father. Uh, he hadn't sided with his other brothers in rebellion. So he then became the emperor. He appointed his own archbishop, Hinkmar, uh, and there was some strife for a while. Uh, Ebo um, ended up in the monastery at uh, Hildesheim in Germany, um, but he was deposed as archbishop. I will also say one thing about Ebo as art patron. He had the fortune to have one of the most remarkable artists in the history of art working in a scriptorium, presumably at the monastery at Hovers, uh, in his diocese, in the Diocese of Rams. And so uh, because of that, uh, people who are you know, uh, not just Carolingian scholars, Carolingian historians, but people who are interested in art uh, do know the name of Ebo, and if they know nothing else about him. A number of Carolingian manuscripts display common stylistic traits, a new expressionistic style of sketchy, agitated lines and exaggerated features that suggest excitement or inspiration. The bodies are often hunched over with the enlarged hands gesturing. And you also see the repetition of animated lines and zigzags both in the contours of the figure and in the folds of the drapery and in the hemlines. Uh, and these draperies often appear to wrap the body. These illustrations seem to be based on lost classical and or early Christian manuscripts that probably had a breezy painterly style that uh, translated into these animated lines. In other words, taking it from a kind of a painterly impressionism uh, and uh, wedding that to dynamic linearism. Now, we've said that this inscription tells us that this was created at the monastery, or that Abbot Peter at the monastery of Hovers gave the manuscript to Ebo. Presumably, then, uh, it was created at the monastery at Hovers. We do not know who the artist was. Um, I'm going to call him the Ebo master. But this is this very distinctive style, which was extremely influential. And so we believe that it was produced at the monastery of Hovers in the Rems diocese during Ebo's episcopacy. So just a general date around 820, you know, plus and minus. 
And this style, uh, in the first edition of Medieval Art, Jim Snyder said that this, the Rem style was a fountainhead of dynamic linearism uh, and was an influence on uh, future art. And we're going to look at two works from the same monastery because of the style. Uh, one is the Ebo Gospels and the other is the Utrecht Psalter. Um, the same hand, whom I'm calling the Ebo Master, also appears in the Utrecht Psalter, along with some other hands that uh, seem to be related. You may remember that when we were talking about the Vienna Genesis, I said, remember those styles of trees, remember those umbrella trees, because I knew this was coming up and I wanted to show you this detail. So back in the sixth century Vienna Genesis, uh, a very classicizing manuscript, presumably copied from an early Christian manuscript. And here we also have another version of the umbrella tree, as I'm calling it, uh, in the Ebo Gospels. So presumably copied from uh, or adapted from uh, late antique, uh, early Christian manuscript models. And uh, you can see, because this is blowing up, I mean, many, many times, you can see uh, the actual uh, uh, paint strokes uh, and the repetition of, of the curving lines that just gives this uh, dynamic quality uh, to the uh, Ebo Master's work. And at the top of the hill behind the, uh, the evangelist St. Matthew, uh, we see these little classical temples. And you know, they look like very free, sketchy versions of classical temples that we actually do find in uh, Roman frescoes. Uh, so uh, he would never have seen this Roman fresco, I'm sure, but uh, as you can see, here's these little uh, temples in the background. And uh, they do bear a relationship. So we, we're assuming that these are in uh, manuscripts that he has seen and he's adapting them uh, to his own personal style. Now I'm going to show you this manuscript page with uh, the Coronation Gospels, St. Matthew. And those will illustrate the relationship of the Ebo Gospels to the palace school. In other words, we think that what it is is that they have a common model. And I might point out, as, as much dynamic linearism is in the Ebo Gospels, we also see some illusionism. Uh, we see drapery lines that wrap the body. We see the figures that turn in space. We see shading and light and dark. So here we look at them. We have St. Matthew from the Coronation Gospels. We have St. Matthew from the Ebo Gospels. And as you can see, uh, they seem to have the same general pose. Uh, they are both placed uh, in uh, a near profile, uh, but with a little bit of the body showing. So it seems to be actually solid and extending into space. Uh, they are focused on their writing. They're both holding uh, this, this horn, which would have contained ink. She was as a, uh, and so we think that they probably had a common model. Now, by the Episcopacy of Ebo, uh, started in 816, Charlemagne would have already been dead, and the Coronation Gospels would have been presumably buried with him. Uh, so it would be unlikely that the artist had seen the Coronation Gospels. Uh, but we do think that there probably was a common model and that that's where the similarities are coming from. Here we're looking close up and you're starting to see some real differences here. There's more line in the Ebo Gospels and the line is, I, I, I want to almost call it's not really scribbly. It's, uh, but it's very free, it's sketchy. It's very sketchy. Um, and you can see that the hair, instead of this uh, close cut, smooth, uh, Roman-like hairdo, uh, the Ebo Gospels, uh, St. Matthew has hair that almost looks like snakes. <laughs> it's uh, twisting and writhing and uh, very animated. Uh, the, cha the, the shading on his face is made up of parallel strokes. And yes, he's got shading. Uh, but you also notice how big the eyes are. There was a focus on the eyes with the Coronation Gospels, 
But look at those eyes in the Ebo Gospels. They're huge. Um, someone's called the uh, eyebrows. They look like caterpillars. He says, climbing up. Uh, and they, you know, they seem to really uh, 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 bug out as he's looking at what he's going to be writing on the page. He's really focused. Uh, you can see that the hands derive from hands that are very similar to the uh, Coronation Gospels, but they have a, a dark outline around them. And then the fingers are elongated and uh, uh, sort of exaggerated. And this really makes us focus on the page. It also suggests sort of the frenzy of divine inspiration. We see divine inspiration suggested by the style itself, the agitated line, the snaky hair, those large eyes and exaggerated fingers. Wow. And we've already said the energetic lines wrap the body. They convey the excitement. Uh, the, the, if you look at the back, you'll see that it's almost a sort of zigzag contour and that the hill behind him is made up of uh, curving lines. Uh, the hem of the garment uh, falls in, once again, sort of uh, zigzags uh, that are very energetic. The whole thing suggests divine illumination. And there is a detail of the angel. Very, very sketchy. He's really you know, transparent. Uh, he's a symbol of St. Matthew. He's holding up his scroll. He's there to provide inspiration to the author, but the author is uh, focusing on what he's writing. And uh, just to show you a few more of the parallels, we have the Coronation Gospels with the Ebo Gospels. Uh, here we're seeing the legs of the Coronation Gospels uh, evangelist and uh, the Ebo Gospels. And you can see what's happened. The illusionistic shading has now become energetic line. And it, yes, it does suggest three-dimensionality. Uh, the shin of the uh, Ebo evangelist is pressed against the, the drapery, and yet uh, he basically uses line uh, to create uh, the shading and the feeling of three-dimensionality. And here's just an example of the uh, Aachen Gospels, where you have that uh, three-dimensionality uh, and illusionism and what, how it's been transformed in the Ebo Gospels. Uh, St. Mark in the Ebo Gospels. Once again, we see that feeling of divine inspiration created by the energy of style, uh, the expressive exaggeration of forms, uh, and this just gives you this feeling of excitement, of divine inspiration. Uh, here, the evangelist is looking at his symbol. The little uh, lion has flown in with a scroll that he can, I guess, read the words off of. Uh, his eyes are really focused on that figure. And you might notice that St. Mark has that square, uh, heavy Roman jaw, uh, but the very large uh, and expressive eyes. Uh, his knees are, are supposed to project forward, and he's actually seated on a uh, kind of Roman stool with the uh, lion's head and lion's feet. So once again, dynamic linearism, the repetition of the sketchy lines or brushstrokes, and the jagged outlines uh, that mark the style of this artist and uh, our idea of the REM school. We can see Mark, it does turn in space. He's twisted up to look at his symbol. Uh, and that may remind us of a classical contraposto, although here it seems to be a little exaggerated, especially sort of the, the hunchback feeling that he, you, you get from, that, uh, uh, from the shoulder that's uh, upward most. And once again, that idea of divine inspiration. Here is St. Luke. I'm going to show you all four of the Gospels and the Ebo Gospels. We see that what the Ebo Master is doing is combining the classical illusionistic tradition with the tradition of northern dynamic linearism, uh, extremely dynamic. And this creates a new style. And if you think about it as sort of um, on one side, 
uh, we have northern dynamic linearism and abstraction. And on the other side, we have the tradition of classical illusionism. And you can see these as a, a kind of uh, Y or a funnel. And they come together and create a new style. And Carolingian art and architecture create new forms that will become what is uniquely Western medieval art. Uh, they are creating something new out of these influences. Here's St. John, James John the Evangelism. Once again, he's uh, twisted around. He's looking up at his symbol, the eagle. Here he's writing on a very large and uh, dynamic scroll. And you'll notice that John here has a long beard. Um, there's different ways of portraying John. Uh, oftentimes, if you're seeing a narrative scene uh, with John at the time of Christ, with Christ, um, you'll see him as youth, clean-shaven. Uh, John the Evangelist was the youngest of the apostles. He's known as the beloved disciple. Um, but sometimes in evangelist portraits, you'll see him as an old man with a long beard. And that's because there was a tradition that St. John was 99 years old when he composed the Gospels. And you see that often in Byzantine art uh, and in Carolingian manuscripts. Uh, I want to point out something else too, the borders of these. Uh, you can see that the border is an acanthus leaf border, a very classicizing border. Uh, but the acanthus leaves are on the diagonal. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have movement, they have action, so they have been transformed into uh, this uh, dynamic pattern. And now we're going to look at the incipit page to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Uh, once again, I mean, you can read this very clearly, the incipit, the beginning of the Gospel, the Evangelium, uh, according to Matthew, the book of generations. Uh, you know, you can, it's very, very clear letter forms. Uh, and this, of course, are the letter forms um, that were copied by uh, Renaissance artists. And they thought that these were actually, I mean, not this manuscript particularly, but that Carolingian manuscripts were actual classical manuscripts and that they were copying the classical letter forms. Well, actually, they were fairly right because the Carolingians were copying and adapting the classical letter forms from the manuscripts that they copied. So. We have these very, very clear and uh, letter forms. Uh, they are perfectly readable to us because they are the beginning of our modern letter forms. But if you look at the initial, you've seen the Anglo-Saxon influence. Uh, you're seeing the um, interlace pattern. And, you know, maybe I could have taken that out and tried to fool you and made you think that it was a Hiberno-Saxon manuscript, but it's probably the influence of Anglo-Saxon monks and manuscripts that have been brought to, uh, to the Carolingian Empire uh, from Britain. And uh, here is the Evo Gospels, a canon page, the concordance between the Gospels. Uh, here they've only got three... Uh, three columns, so presumably one of the Gospels doesn't have this, uh, what they're writing about in it. Um, but you can see that the architecture looks, I guess, a little bit uh, more classical than some we've seen. It actually has a pediment uh, and columns and, and capitals, uh, but uh, they're, they're very lively. <laughs> the, uh, the columns have ferns or foliage, uh, some leaves growing out of them. And on the top you have a little hunting scene uh, with very whimsical figures. And uh, here the hunter has thrown a spear into the uh, chest of the lion, but the lion is smiling. <laughs> it's, a, like it's, it's not bothering him at all. Uh, and we see these uh, very, very sketchy, uh, um, and we see these very sketchy plant forms. I'll tell you what they always remind me of. And here you'll really have to think back. But if you go back to the catacombs, the Catacomb of Priscilla and the Good Shepherd, there are these very sketchy, scribbly um, plant forms on either side of the Good Shepherd. And that's, that's what they remind me of. 
Uh, so they may very well have been taken from a more classicizing manuscript that was you know, very impressionistic. And uh, this is how you translate that into uh, a more uh, linear pattern, somewhere between linear and painterly. Uh, you can also see the acanthus leaves on the diagonal uh, as the border of the entablature and the pediment here.